Okay, so La Trobe University acknowledges that this event and our participants are located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. We recognise their ongoing connection to the land and value their unique contribution to the university and wider Australian society. We pay our respects to Indigenous elders, past, present and emerging, and extend this respect to any Indigenous participants joining us online today. So I'd like to thank all the students for coming today. I know you guys all have classes and things like that. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand, turn on your camera, or you can just write into the chat and I would um, uh, ask the question on your behalf. Um, and I just want to remind you to complete the attendance form. So I'm just going to drop it into the chat now, um, especially those who are trying to get career advantage points. Um, please fill that one out. Okay, um, today's panel, um, we have quite a strong panel today, but I think some people are a bit late, so we might have some latecomers on there. I will just post in the details of today's panel panelists um, just on the left there. So I'd like to introduce the ones that are here today. So we have Michelle Lugton, Data Science Lead at Coles, and we also have Christy Lim, the Head of Cybersecurity at Officeworks. So to begin the session, I'd like to ask Christy, if you can give me an overview of your career, a summary of what you studied, the type of roles and organisations that you've worked for, and where you're working now, and explain some of your day-to-day -day tasks. Thank you, um, Catalina, and hello students, how are you? Uh, it feels like not so long ago, but it was actually uh, 26 years ago, I was once like you at La Trobe University, pursuing my bachelor degree. And um, I know the stress that some of you are going through because uh, it felt like yesterday I was still stressed about my uni exam. So very, very, um, feel very privileged to have this opportunity to talk to you guys. So um, I guess um, I, 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 I'm, my current job is head of uh, cybersecurity for Officeworks. And um, my journey started with, uh, with uh, you know, being a graduate from La Trobe University 20 plus years ago, who is counting? And I study a Bachelor of Science at that time and Bachelor of Computer Science with double major accounting and computing. I think that was what it's called. Um, I'm sure with uh, very social media savvy, you guys, you guys can check out my profile on LinkedIn. Um, so that they probably have more information than what I can remember. Um, in terms of my journey, my career journey, um, oh, where do I start? Um, but um, I guess if I can just start with my current role uh, and then maybe I can fit in more stories about my journey, but my current role at Officeworks, essentially I'm responsible for the cybersecurity strategy, making sure that Officeworks can continue to be a successful business, serving customers what they want um, and, and they can get Officeworks as service and products anywhere they like with confidence that uh, they are shopping with a trusted brand and that confidence is very much uh, 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 tied to how we protect customers' privacy in terms of their data, their credit card uh, as they shop with us. So essentially my job is to make sure that uh, we protect customer data privacy and security so that it doesn't get uh, you know, um, at, uh, into the wrong hand of the bad guys. Um, my career started uh, as a consultant. Uh, I worked for one of the big four company um, and, and with my degree, uh, accounting and computing, I was given the option to go into financial auditor uh, or otherwise IT auditor. Um, so I was very fresh in, you know, no one trained me for how to interview. Unlike you guys are in a very good position, you get this opportunity to uh, learn about uh, recruitment. Um, being a very naive, I, I asked the recruiter, which job pay more? And um, you, you would have guessed IT job pays more than finance. And uh, that was how I get into cyber. So I, I joke about I choose cybersecurity for money, but to stay in the job for 25 years, it, it takes more than money to, to stay in the job. It is no doubt a very stressful job and, and job with high power as some people's opinion but it comes with that great responsibility. I'm sure you guys can think of the people who said that uh, in, in some of the movies that you watch. So that, that's how I felt at times in my job. You know, my job come with great responsibility, great power, 
um, and and it's a really true privilege to be in. Um, but cybersecurity is, is a big challenge for many many organisations, and therefore, for you for you people who are studying in cybersecurity and have a passion for cybersecurity, I'm very excited about your future because we we need new people joining that industry to to help organization to uh to better manage the data security um i, I can go on and on given uh, the history i've been in in the cyber security world catalina so so i, I might just stop it there and um and let uh, michelle have a chance to to introduce herself thanks christy and just reading some of the comments so james ibrahim said with great knowledge comes great power so thanks james for your input on that um, so next we have Michelle Lugton. So Michelle, um, she is a data science lead at Coles. So if you can tell us a little bit about your career, um, your transition from uni to your first job and what you're working on now and explain some of your day-to-day -day tasks and responsibilities. Cool, thanks Gad. Hi everyone, Michelle here. It wasn't long ago that I was a student at Latrobe. It was actually two years ago when I, um, when I graduated from, from my master's. Um, in business analytics. Um, my career journey isn't as straightforward. So I remember um, back in the Philippines where I um, was born and, and um, I grew up there and lived there for 20 years before moving to Australia. Um, I was trying to decide what course I would take. And I was thinking, I was choosing between journalism, <laughs> um, mathematics, or engineering. So three totally different courses. And um, my dad said, do engineering because the money is there. Don't do maths because there's no money in maths. But I was like, but I really, I really love maths. I'm passionate about it. But it's like, yeah, think about the money. <laughs> I was like, sure. So I did um, four years of mechanical engineering um, back home. Um, and then on at the end of my fourth year, the whole family decided to migrate to Australia. And I had a choice whether to stay there to finish the course or and risk not being able to, to go to Australia at all or move to Australia with um, my family, which, which I did. Um, so when we moved to Australia, um, I was given the chance to um, continue my um, studies. So it was either I continue um, my course that I started um, back home in, in mechanical engineering, or I can do I can do a course that I want. Um, and because I funded my my course when you moved to Australia, I decided, you know what? Start those four years of engineering. I'll do what I've been passionate about and what I really want to do. So I then um, studied mathematics for my um, for my undergrad not really knowing then like analytics and data science wasn't really a thing when I started um, my undergrad so I didn't really know then where that course would take me but it was more you know if I thought if I follow my passion surely it would take me somewhere so I studied mathematics and then um, I did a placement um, at the uh, in the analytics department at Crown Casino in, in Melbourne in my last year of uni and um, I was lucky enough to get a role as an analyst straight after my last exam, which was awesome. Um, and while I was at Crown, I then started um, studying master's in business analytics um, at Latrobe part time while I was working full time, which was very challenging. <laughs> um, so after after my gig at Crown, um, I moved to flybys for another analyst role. Um, a year later, um, I then um, started working as a data scientist um, at Coles before then moving to my um, current role now as a data science lead. So not really a, a, like a, a straightforward journey. So my role uh, as a data science lead, so I lead a team of beautiful minds, <laughs> I, I always say, of data scientists. So mainly um, to deliver um, you know, key analytical, analytical projects um, at calls from planning and scoping requirements with our um, stakeholders um, to working with my team to um, brainstorm, develop, 
and implement um, technical solutions. So I've worked on a lot of um, different uh, data science projects, but I think the biggest one that I've been working on um, is focused on um, range optimi optimization, um, which ensures that you know, every coal store has the right product range. So, so yeah, um, that's, that's basically my background. Fantastic, thanks Michelle for that. Um, so I'm gonna launch into a couple of questions. Um, so the first one, Christy, if you can answer this one, what skills or personal qualities um, enable graduate, graduates to thrive in your profession? So what are some skills and personal qualities that you've seen? Mm. Um, I, I think, um, uh, cybersecurity has a very broad range of different domains. So we, we require different sets of uh, qualities and skill sets. Um, so if I think about in the recent compliance, we need someone with ability to uh, translate a boring regulation into how do we practice that in real life. So that ability to um, uh, articulate and translate, a, you know, a legal statement into this is what it means to our business. So the quality there I'll be looking for are uh, people who uh, can do research independently, you know, study on their own of a, a piece of legislation and then go through the discipline of um, structuring how do we going to apply this um, 500 requirements into our business process where it makes sense. So the, the acumen around articulating why, why the compliance is bringing value to our business is very important because no longer uh, organization would say we just do it for the purpose of meeting the law or legislation they also want to know for me to invest money in your compliance program I need to know how is that going to help build our business so the quality I'll be looking for in that graduates is someone who have the patience to do research and have the ability to study um, something new and then translate in a um, in, in a format that business audience can understand, appreciate. And then if I take another extreme of what uh, kind of jobs we're looking for in cybersecurity world, it's um, say in the security operations, threat intelligence um, and threat hunting and analyzing logs. So that type of role require um, qualities in terms of uh, ability to digest a large amount of data, a bit like data scientists in a sense, actually, now I think about Michelle as well, you know, in the system logs, we have a lot of data uh, tracking what the system do, what the user do. And the SecOps analyst in this case, quite often in a junior role, needs to have the ability to um, understand the format of the data and then break it down into a data modeling to understand what is normal and what is not normal, right? Well, so so I, I guess the skill required there is ability to learn a new tool and understand the data sets, have strong database skill sets behind them, how to, um, you know, um, format unstructured data into a structured data, produce um, trend analysis report, um, yeah, so I think uh, that, that that will be something really useful for graduates to come and, and show that they have ability to, to massage large amount of data and put into something meaningful. Thanks, Christy. And Michelle, do you have any other skills and qualities that you would like to add? Yes, I, I agree with Christy in terms of, um, you know, ability to quickly learn um, for sure. And, you know, it's, it's a world of big data now, right? Everywhere you go, you have data. So that, that ability to, like what Christy said, massage that data and turn it into something insightful is definitely um, um, a skill that, that thrive um, in, in, in this industry. Um, I also kind of answer that question a, a bit differently. So you know, I can talk about all the technical skills that's required um, to be successful in, in the data science space. However, those skills 
you see them in, in job advertisements, right? But so let me talk about um, a bit of, um, or some of the soft skills that you actually don't see recruiters or employers um, uh, include in their job advertisement. So, you know, in terms of um, soft skills, I think business acumen is, is number one. Um, there are plenty of grads in, in the industry who can do the job. And, you know, when you finish uni, you all have sort of the same, same skills um, that you, you learn from, from uni, right? Um, so you, I'm sure you, you'd be able to do the job and complete any tasks that uh, will be given to you. Um, but I find that only a few can look at the results and go, does this make business sense? Um, it looks technically sensible. I look at the, the, the formulation in the equation, the mathematical equation, and it looks brilliant um, and spot on. But is it operationally implementable? Um, and also the other thing being able to engage and work effectively with, with stakeholders, um, especially those non-technical ones and, and the ability to translate technical concepts to your non-technical audience, um, I think are, are also as important. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so I can see that James Ibrahim has a question, and I also got a couple of questions in chat, but I'll go to James first if you wanted to ask a question. Yeah, so I had a question for Christy. Um, so I was just wondering, yeah, in terms of the, uh, um, I guess the auditing kind of stuff and uh, risk and compliance and all that, I feel like that's kind of the more boring side of cybersecurity. Um, in terms of like the fun stuff where you look at threats and threat analysis and uh, all that kind of stuff, um, as a like uh, a graduate, is that something that um, you know uh, graduates can get straight into, or is that something that kind of takes time or for it like um, you know for someone new to the field um, who doesn't have much industry experience? Um, yeah, because that's kind of probably where I'm more interested in cybersecurity mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to auditing and, you know, just working with legal stuff. I prefer the more, you know, mm -hmm. tech savvy kind of uh, side of cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th th thank you for uh, sharing that, James. Um, first, I would say both are equally important. So which is why we need different sets of uh, personality, skill set characteristic to really form the cybersecurity team to protect organization. Um, it may not seem that way, but it's risk and compliance that gets security team the budget, the funding, and the compliance tick. tick. Without the risk and compliance under control, it's very hard for the cool and fun things to get the money. So I guess that that's that's important context, I think, for, for uh, anyone that wants to join a security team to appreciate each other, that that's what, um, what's required to form a good team, a good cybersecurity team. But let's talk about the fun and, and, and the cool things in the SecOps world. Um, is there opportunity for the graduates to join? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, quite often we have um, people who have done um, a few years of um, hardware service support <clears throat> and those are also good candidates to jump across so while you are studying you know take the time to learn about how computers are put together how the software coding um, works what are the programming languages out there because if you think about the cyber um, attack they are all uh, targeting your software if not your hardware or operating systems and that that, that's where the, the knowledge, the fundamentals of uh, how software development works and how a, a, a operating system supporting the software to run, those are very, very fundamental knowledge um, to, to come into the role. And definitely there, there is opportunity for graduates to join the SecOps side of uh, function and learn from the foundation and, and, and um, Again, the experience from there. So James, certainly there is junior position in that SecOps as well. Yep. And the recent yep. compliance role, as boring as it sounds, you actually require a lot of 
skill sets to uh, keep your audience um, uh, the confidence that you have got cybersecurity under control for your organization. So um, I wouldn't underestimate the, the, the significance of risk compliance. The, the work may be dry, but it's nevertheless very, very critical for our success. Yeah, thanks for that. And just a follow-up question. Um, I, I'm just conscious that there's you know quite a few other people who like to get the chance to ask a question, but when you say SecOps, I know that there's a lot of terminology in cybersecurity, SecOps being security operations as far as I know. Uh, there's all sorts of terms like DevOps as well, uh, mm. development or whatever operations. Uh, could you distinguish kind of those two? I guess I'm sure there's more areas, but um, yeah, what yep. the, the fundamental differences are in those areas? Good question, James. So um, I'll talk about DevOps first. So Dev, DevOps are very much software development and how to support a piece of software oriented. So that tends to be um, very much focused on the um, uh, working with software development as well as the software support team to make sure that we protect that, that digital product uh, uh, securely. Um, but when I use SecOps, it cover broader sense of security operation, things like how do we protect network security, 24 seven monitoring, um, threat intel, um, incident response. So SecOps has a broader coverage of the entire organization um, security, starting from network, endpoint, um, all the way to um, the data security. Yeah, hopefully that, that gives you a bit of context, but DevOps tends to be more oriented to this software development. How do we secure uh, the software development lifecycle to make sure there is continuous um, security monitoring, vulnerability assessment, testing, and as well as the whole lifecycle of the application as it moves into production. Yeah, that's clear. Thank, that thanks, thanks, James. It does. Thanks, Christy. Um, I'll move on to Amri. He's written a question here in the chat, but I could see that he's got the hand up. So if you can just ask that question, that'll be great. Uh, yeah, I was just asking um, how someone from cybersecurity would get into uh, forensics or, or like a similar area like that. Mm, th there is specialized course for digital forensic. Um, and that job usually leads to becoming a, a digital um, uh, forensic analyst or investigator uh, type of uh, role. It's a very, very specialized role and it's often called upon when there is a, a cyber breach. And it, it's the type of skill you don't use on a day-to-day, -day, but you only use when there is specific security breach that you need some deep dive forensic investigation of a, someone's hard disk to see if you know any um, detailed analysis of the user activities to 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 um, investigate what happened. For instance, um, certainly you can work towards that uh, by studying the specialized course that look at forensic investigation. Um, I'm sure there's a certification on SANS course, but to get to that specialty, uh, I guess um, the jobs to the jobs for digital forensic is probably very, very, very limited. But nevertheless, you know, it's available out there. F from my experience, I only hire a digital um, forensic investigator when there is a high value, high risk incidents, it's not the type of skill I hire every day. I use every day, yeah. Does that answer your question, Amri? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so now the next question is coming from our chat. Uh, this question's for Christy. Where do you see cybersecurity in the next decade? So that's from Rohit. Ooh. Well, I can't even see it beyond the next three years, to be honest. Um, thank you for that question. You know, certainly in my last 20 years, cybersecurity has changed so much. When I started my career, cybersecurity term didn't even exist. 
it was it was regarded as IT controls, and then gradually become data security and information security, where organizations start to realize it's not about the data sets, the database, it's about the information we are protecting. And then from there, it become a cyber security. So it changes a lot in, in the last 20 years from where I begin. And where would it be in 10 years? I think cybersecurity will go beyond where we are protecting today, which is within the perimeter of our organization. So as I work for Office Works, my, my scope of responsibility, if you like, it's about protecting the border and everything inside, as well as the machines that we, you know, we give out to our contractors or staff to use. But I think in 10 years, whatever in the similar role, and if I'm doing a similar role, my scope of protection will go very, very much broader than that. Um, given, you know, companies are starting and, and have been using um, IoT, uh, encourage personal devices, um, and also inviting third party to connect. And that will continue to be uh, a norm. And the more and more we trusting personal devices like BYOD, bring your own device, as well as third party, because organization may not want to keep buying devices, right? So we want to start trusting our third party to use their device. I think the role, um, my role, uh, sim or at any role similar to mine will start to become a lot broader, that we cannot just look at what's within our border and as, as our direct protection. So I think that that in terms of the cybersecurity role will become very, very big. Um, hopefully, hopefully not more challenging than what it is today. Um, Yes, I guess there's no surprise if you Google it, a lot of cybersecurity professional like me are working long hours and constantly under a lot of pressure to make sure that we, we don't overlook simple things. And it's those simple things that we sometimes overlook, they will come, come back to bite us. Um, yeah, I don't mean to scare you, but I hope that it inspire you to join the forces um, because in, in an industry, we are, we are in shortage of people with passions for high challenging job and, and um, have that strong dedication to, I'm not just doing a job, I'm here to do a right thing by the innocent people who are being taken advantage by the bad guy. So go back to what I was saying, what keeps me in the job is not just the money. The money is good, I, I won't deny that but it's the passion that you, you will go extra miles to do whatever it takes to stop the next attack because you just don't want the bad guys to win. It's that passion that drive a lot of cybersecurity professionals to stay in the job. Without that passion, you will find the job is stressful. It's, it's, it's just not worth, worth putting your 100%. And if that is how you are feeling, then you know, you, 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 you probably wouldn't enjoy the work and then you might be putting your company at risk. Thanks, Christy. And yeah, that's a really good point, especially during the recruitment phase when you're going for an interview. Um, yeah, just to really display that passion that you have. Um, mm. So we'll move on to the uh, next question in the chat. So Habib has asked, and I'll direct this one at Michelle. Um, what about those technical skills and ability abilities which are not usually described in the job description but still make a difference for an individual in the workplace? Cool. Um, I was going to type my, my response in the chat and then I got lazy um, and I thought I'll, uh, I'll just um, uh, say my answer. So I think in terms of technical skills, going back to when I uh, finished my undergrad, because because I did pure maths, I thought that the technical skills that I learned at uni, I will just directly apply to the tasks that I'll be given when I start um, my job. So I was doing integration and derivatives um, in my undergrad, and I thought, you know, surely I will just need to directly apply um, those skills. Um, but I think it turns out, and and this is probably not 
the direct answer to your question. Um, but so it, it turns out what we're taught in uni, um, I think master's is a bit different because um, there's definitely specific skills that um, we are taught um, as part of our masters that we can directly apply to our to our jobs. Um, but I think more importantly, regardless if it's an undergrad or, or master's, it's the problem solving skill. It's it's the ability to look at a problem, dissect it, think outside the box, um, and and come up with a solution. Um, I think I think problem solving skill is not something that that um, employers or recruit recruiters um, explicitly mention in their job ads, but definitely a skill that when I interview candidates, um, I, I usually ask questions to to really flesh out how they would solve the problem. And it's not it's not quite like it's not quite getting to the hundred percent correct answer, but also their thinking, their their thought process on how to get there, if, if that makes sense. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and I'll just hand it over to Ian Tan, who would like to ask a question. You'll see your hand up there. Hey, hi. Hi, Catalina. Thank you. Yeah, I, my question is for Christy. Um, so um, being a recent graduate for cybersecurity, I'm actually um, asking in this, uh, on the other side of James's question, so um, I'm more keen on the risk and compliance side of cybersecurity, and I'm I'm just um, keen to know from you, like how would I get to? What would your recommendations be on how to get my foot in the door? Um, you mentioned for like um, the technical side of it, like you know getting certifications and all those things, but then for risk and compliance, like what would your recommendations be for that one? Um. I guess there, there are many industry standards there, Ian. Thank you for the questions. So um, there, there is a risk of trying to study all of them, which uh, is probably not uh, a good use of your time. But certainly um, there are a few key ones that we know in Australia businesses um, that, that uh, a lot of uh, businesses have to comply, if not uh, uh, have to follow as a best practice. So I guess uh, as a graduate, as your site reading, um, you could study COVID. Um, COVID uh, is, I think it stands for Common Objective for IT Control. And the reason why COVID is still popular because uh, a lot of the big four companies, they built their audit uh, program based on COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and then from the practice, um, being part of the internal security team, we tend to use ISO standards 27,000 and 7,001 and two. So if you look up ISO standards, that's a, that's a good, uh, good reference to get familiar with. Um, so I guess um, as you go for interview, if I'm the, your interviewer, I'll be, I'll be looking to see if you have some knowledge about what ISO domains mm -hmm. and, and how they relate to the regulations, for instance. All right. The last one is NIST, N-I-S-T, uh, Cybersecurity Framework. Mm -hmm. and they're all US-based, isn't it? ISO and uh, NIST, they're all US-based, but they are global uh, best practice reference. So if you've got, if you, you know, uh, find some time to read about those three standards, um, it will put you in a really good position when you interview for your first job, uh, mm -hmm. showing your interviewer that uh, you are doing some study. Mm. about industry standards okay thank you um just as a follow-up though because um i remember we we discussed in some like um i think we had some subjects a couple of them which discussed those um standards do you recommend that i um take the certifications as well prior to um like applying for jobs and and mm. roles uh, you might need to check the website for the certification there are certification that require work experience Oh, okay. So you okay. you can study. Uh, the, those organizations usually welcome you to study and mm -hmm. take the exam, but you may not be qualified for okay. the certification until you have certain years of experience. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Pleasure. 
Thanks, Christy. And just on that, we have a um, similar question. Do certifications or volunteering in, uh, side of, in cybersecurity help with the recruitment process? So how do you stand out and prove skills to employers? And that's from Rohit. Uh, I haven't come across volunteer in cybersecurity team, to be honest. Uh, I guess we, we do treat cybersecurity role as high, highly sensitive role. So perhaps the voluntary opportunity has never been um, suggested. Um, having said, it is a good idea. So I might even share that uh, idea with our HR department. Certainly they can get some legal, legal paperwork in place to make sure the volunteer is abide by the similar contract that our employees sign up. But it, it's a good, uh, good idea. Thanks for that uh, suggestion. Uh, yes, I will say uh, if, if there is opportunity to get into a um, voluntary or trainee uh, or some kind of intern program, uh, certainly by living in the job, you know, giving the hands-on experience or even just observe what the uh, security professional are doing day to day, it will help you to um, prepare for, for your first job, yes. Definitely highly encourage. Thank you. Um, so I'll just jump over to Eva, who has a question, who's raised their hand. Yes, hi. Um, I have probably too many questions, um, but they're all for Christy again. Um, so I guess I'll just say the one that I actually feel most uh, is relevant to me, which is um, it's quite uh, intimidating for me um, to think about the prospects of going into such a male dominated workforce um, in cybersecurity. And it's great that we have two women representing STEM on the panel yet there, but um, I'm wondering if that actually has been a challenge for you at all and um, like how it's been overcome and, and yeah, just more about that. Yeah, thanks for the question, Eva. Uh, it, it's a fantastic question. So as an industry, we are still not quite balanced in our talent pool. I go extra miles to create opportunity for female candidates, but they just don't come often enough. So congratulations to you for studying IT uh, course, um, because we do need diversity. Uh, we need diversity to create different ideas and bring different perspective. It can be intimidating, but in, mo in, my, in my experience, uh, I guess I consider myself lucky. I never felt being mistreated or disrespected. Um, so being a female, I never felt like I was given any advantage or disadvantage, to be honest. It's all about, um, you know, be professional. Uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, I can only speak for my own experience. Um, I guess uh, I, I do pick companies that I work for carefully. Um, you know, office work, for instance, I know office work is big on community work and they're also promoting gender balance and, uh, and ha have specific programs for First Nations. So those, those little things tells me about organization culture. Um, hence, I, I pick office works. And likewise, for the previous organization I pick, that there's always something about the organization uh, culture that why, why I felt my time is worthy to, to go to the company to make a difference. Um, so Eva, uh, I would say, don't, don't feel intimidated, you know, just be yourself because we need people like you to join the team, to share the different perspective. Um, otherwise, if it's just one-sided uh, perspective, it, it will not build a high-performing team. So just believe in yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and while I have you, Oh, sorry. sorry for those who felt they have a lot of questions for me, but don't get to ask today, please feel, feel free to um, connect me through LinkedIn and send me questions. I'm more than happy to help uh, and, and answer any question if, if we run out of time. Yeah, I might just do that. <laughs> and let Thanks, someone else ask. All right, thank you. Thank you, great question. Um, so I'll just, yeah, so that was one of the questions on the chat as well, if you guys are willing to share your LinkedIn. Uh, Michelle, would, would you be okay to answer some questions as well? All right, thanks, Michelle. Um, so this question is for Michelle. Can you su suggest some ways to those 
without industry experience as, um, as a business analysis. So when they're applying for jobs without any experience and there's no volunteer ex uh, opportunities, what can they do? Yep. So I think, I think um, recently universities try really hard to connect with um, companies so that um, most, if not all, students give, uh, are given um, an opportunity to have industry experience. But especially with COVID, I think a lot of students kind of miss out um, from, from getting um, that industry experience, right? Um, I, I think the best thing is that when you do interviews, you really need to be able to sell yourself. Um, Industry experience obviously is an advantage, um, especially if you're applying for a role um, within the same company. Um, but a lot of us or some students don't even um, have uh, that experience and it's, it's totally fine. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not like, you know, you probably won't get a job because you don't have an industry experience, but you know, you've, you have the skills that you learned from, from your course. Um, it's about being able to, to sell yourself in interviews and really showcase um, the skills that you have and finding a company that can really um, trust you and invest in you in terms of, you know, of you being new to the industry. So yeah, don't, don't feel that you're disadvantaged um, if you don't have any industry experience. Thanks, Michelle. And I'll turn this over to Lily, who has a question. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for your um, uh, sharing of your experiences. Um, I, I have a question about the, uh, the future of the data scientist. So it, is your job more like, the, like business analytics or it's more like machine learning aspect? And how, how do you think uh, which direction um, our future students should go uh, and, uh, and the change of time, please. Yep, thanks for your question. Um, there's no right or wrong answer there. Business analytics or machine learning, or, or one of them is not, is not better than the other. It really depends on where your, your passion is. If you have the, the skill in, the, the relevant skills in both aspects, I think that's, that's a big win. Um, I think machine learning is 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 more specific. Like very, it, it's a it's a very technical skill. Um, but if you also have um, some skills in business um, analytics, and which I mentioned before, that ability to make business sense of things, um, I think you know that's that's a really strong combination to have. In terms of um, future for for data scientists. Um, so when I started in the uh, working in the data science team at Coles, there were about four data scientists at Coles then. This was in 2016. Um, five years later, there's about 100 of us in the team. Um, so I guess I don't expect I don't expect the trend to I don't expect us to have 500 data scientists in, in, in the coming years. But I guess more and more companies, um, what you'll find is that they will invest more and more in, into data science and analytics, um, especially in um, industries like retail. Um, as you know, um, the, the retail space is very competitive um, and, and especially with, with the challenges um, coming from, from the pandemic. Um, more and more businesses will, will rely on, on the value of, of analytics and, and data science to ensure that they, everyone keeps their jobs and everyone keeps their, their businesses, basically. So yeah, there's definitely good future in everyone in the call, you are in the right space. I don't see cybersecurity and data analytics dying in the near future. But don't, don't take my word for that. I thought airlines are a pretty safe space, um, you know, a few years ago. Um, but yeah, but kidding aside, I think, yeah, I think cyber, um, cybersecurity and, and data and analytics are, are a pretty, pretty safe space. So well done, everyone, for, for choosing this path. Okay, th uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, another quick question. So uh, if you see a candidate, 
uh, have um, one candidate have some experience, some project, some like in a finance firm, um, uh, involving some um, time analysis of this. Another candidate, um, so who worked in the tech law before, and uh, mostly project is about some uh, model building and some um, some uh, algorithms. So, oh, which kind of project? Uh, which which two? Of, uh, which one of them would you like more prefer to see? Yeah. So, um, I obviously would. Um, be more interested in the candidate to have relevant experience to the role um, uh, that I'm looking for, which is in the in the technology, in the technology space. In saying that, though, if if the other candidate, um, although their experience is in finance, if they have let's say relevant studies or or worked on some finance projects that showcases really good problem solving skills. Um, I would also consider that candidate. Okay, yeah, that, that, that really helps. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so we've just got a question that's come through for Christy. Is it worth looking into Victorian protective data security framework? And that's from Rohit. Hmm. First, I need to look up that particular framework. <laughs> I'll admit I haven't particularly looked into that. Uh, if it sounds like a Victorian government framework, uh, I, then I'm more familiar with the ISM, Information Security Manual, which is from the federal um, government. And in that case, yes. So for Australian government agency and I think organisation that wants to do business with Australian government agencies, uh, there is a requirement that... Uh, uh, those organizations must comply with IREP, which basically uh, is a compliance um, of the information security manual. So IRAP, IREP certification. So there is plenty of job um, in terms of uh, joining the IREP auditing company to help organization get the certification. So that's a good career option to explore as well, become a um, an auditor that help organization get the certification. Um, but apologies, to, uh, I'm not familiar with the Victoria Information Security Framework. I hope yeah. that helps. Yeah, that's okay. Um, we've got another question here for Christy. Uh, how do we transition into our first job in cybersecurity after graduation? What do we do during and after graduation to get into a job in industry? So I feel like that question's more, where, where do we find these jobs? Like, are they on SEEK um, and where are they promoted? Um, it's certainly jobs on SEEK, uh, certainly try on SEEK and LinkedIn. Even jobs that might say, you know, we need one to three years experience but don't be shy still put your application in because you never know what uh, the candidates or the, the organization they're hiring they might be open to hire a junior um, you know looking for someone with uh, uh, quality in the in in the soft skill sites so so don't be shy even the, the job description doesn't exactly um, uh, meet your your years of experience. Um, I think tr the transition from being a student to your first job, what I learned, uh, because I've interviewed a lot of candidates, and what I learned was a lot of candidates, the mistake they make, especially for young um, graduates who never work in the uh, real world, they come to the organization with the expectation that everything will lay out for them. You know, if you come to a job thinking a company will lay out the policies, procedures, have all the tools that you need to do your job successfully, that is a wrong expectation. So I would encourage uh, you, know, um, you guys to think about the company need you to come in and solve problems that they can't solve or otherwise, solve problems in the more efficient way so the company can continue to grow and improve. So always come to the job interview with the mindset that 
you're going to do a lot of self-study. You're going to challenge the current process if it doesn't make sense. You know, always show that you have courage to challenge. Why am I doing this work? How do I contribute to the overall company success? So instead of just accepting the job order, you know, you know, in, um, instead of just coming to the role, expecting your manager will tell you what to do, prepare to ask more questions. Ask your manager, why am I task? And how is this task contribute to the team success? Yeah, so I think that that mindset change will put you in a better position to um, show your manager that you, you are going to help him improve or help her improve instead of, hang on, I'm hiring someone that's waiting for me to tell them what to do. I hope that makes sense. So yeah. that, that transition, I think, is important. Unlike as a student, I think I, I remember 20 plus years ago as a student, I always go to my lecturer, tell me what to do, give me instruction, give me exam papers to practice. But going into the real world, it's important that um, you, you show initiative that you will, you will, I guess, uh, create your own path and find your ways. Um, of course, company will always to, to give you the guidance, instruction, the template to help you to be successful but try not to come in with that expectation that it's by default because it doesn't always uh, lay out for you. And a lot of organization, they, they don't have the process in place, which is why they're hiring people to come in and build those processes. Yeah. Thanks, Christy. I hope that makes sense. Thank yeah, you. it does. A lot of the students have written, have either said that's very helpful advice, or it hits it very nice, and Shabita, thank you. Um, so moving on just to the topic of COVID. So what has COVID done to impact graduates with the recruitment process um, now that everything's online with their um, learning and now they're going to transition as graduates? Is the market saturated with um, graduate applications? Um, so what's the market trends like? Um, maybe Michelle. Me? Michelle first. Yeah. I would say that that's probably um, uh, best answered by someone from from recruitment. Um, I I know that uh, so so Coles graduate program um, is obviously specific um, to grads. The the main thing that's changed there is that the the structure in terms of you know the interviews, the face to face interviews, and um, specific. Um, you know, face-to-face -face sessions are impacted by lockdowns and, and border restrictions, meaning that, you know, those who are those who are interstate who has to come to Melbourne, for example, to, to join a, a graduate session are, are very much impacted. But yeah, in terms of um, uh, saturation of, of, of candidates, probably best answered by someone from recruitment, um, Kat. Thanks, Michelle. Christy, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I agree with Michelle that um, I guess we only limited to what we can see from office works um, in our in calls from Michelle's perspective, but um, that question is probably better answered by someone who specialized recruitment across uh, multiple companies. But from office works, um, I, I, I know this might disappoint many of you. We actually don't have a formal graduates program um, it's something that uh, I know Office Works uh, HR team has been working to 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 uh, to deliver some of the graduate um, students, but at this point we don't. Um, however, I have seen uh, many graduates uh, apply for jobs at different parts of our business. So certainly there is opportunity uh, for graduates, although it's not under the program as such. Um, have I seen more graduates or less graduates? I really don't have statistics uh, on that. So unfortunately, I can't answer. Um, but I can tell you what COVID-19 has changed our workforce in general. You know, so previously we have, we are big on coming to work and make sure that everybody uh, get together and face to face, but that, that's obviously gone out of the window. Everyone work from home. So from a IT workforce, um, it just means that, um, uh, we need to get better at um, sourcing the laptops and, and, and even now we're thinking about um, creating virtual desktop for, 
for our workforce to log into work so that uh, we don't need to uh, wait for four weeks to then get a laptop and ship it out to the new employee who can't wait to uh, start their job. So, so you, I guess it depends on when you're joining the workforce, you know, don't be surprised. You might be given just a link to access your company's system so that you can start your first day at work. Um, because there is a big shortage of uh, computer hardware in the market given the COVID-19 effect. Um, so company like Office Work, we are looking at changing the way we work by giving employees a virtual desktop as their corporate machine to work from home. So that's something interesting to watch out for the future. Thanks, Christy. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just uh, on one o'clock, so we probably have to wrap up this session. I don't know, a lot of people have classes. So just the final question, um, and if any questions have been gone unanswered, please connect with Christy and Michelle on LinkedIn and ask your questions to them. Um, so the final question is, what would you tell your younger self during your final year of your degree? So if you were to go back in time, what's some advice that you would give yourself? So we'll start with you, Michelle. Thanks, Kat. Very interesting question. I feel like my younger self is like, <laughs> like ages away from from today so I think I would say don't worry about the money in your first year and I think Christy kind of touched on this before um, if you think about it you'll be working for at least eight hours a day every single day for five days fine sounds so cliche but please trust me on this find a job that you really enjoy there is obviously we have we have bills to pay. We 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 want to save money for the future. Um, so you know you won't do you won't be doing voluntary work just just for the for the job that you that you love, right? Um, but especially in your first year, don't chase the big box. Find something that is worth waking up for, like working up for and 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 getting up and, and getting ready and spending eight eight hours of your of your life um, every day. Uh, choose a job where you can learn a variety of skills, especially in your um, first few years in the industry, so that you know the more skills that you learn in, in your first few years, at, let's say at the end of the second year, you can go, actually, that skill, hmm, it's good to learn, but I'm not going to pursue it. This skill, actually, I will pursue. So then uh, that will help you decide what path to take um, after those first few years. Um, also, uh, choose a company with a good culture, and especially you know, with, 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 with social media now and, and LinkedIn. Um, and it's also good if you can like message someone on LinkedIn just to um, get some insights on what the company's culture is. So make sure that you, you, know, you find a, a company with really good work-life balance, um, flexible, um, you know, working arrangements, um, a company that encourages learning, um, and also, you know, opportunity to move up the ladder um, if you need. Um, in interviews, just be confident, and I've, I've, I've mentioned this before, ask silly questions and really sell yourself well. In, in interviews, you, you know, most of the time, you won't know your interviewers. Just fake the confidence. Just you know, go up there and go. Okay, I'll, I'll set aside my nerves. I can just be as confident as I can be, even if that's not even yourself. Um, and and yeah, just be confident. And and when you're not nervous, I know this is easy to 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 say. When even you're not nervous, that's when you actually uh, bring out your your best self. And yeah, don't be afraid to to fail. There will be a lot, you know, you will be doing a lot of interviews, hopefully not receiving a lot of, um, of calls saying that you're not successful. But that's, that's, that's a part of life. You, you know, you, you learn from them, um, use them as building blocks. Um, uh, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to hopefully working with, with some of you in the future. Thank you, Michelle. Um, what about you, Christy? What's your word of advice? For my younger self, um, I agree with everything Michelle said. I, I would tell my younger self uh, all of the things that Michelle said. Um, 
uh, I think I would add one more, which is have more fun while you are younger. And, uh, you know, I guess through, through having fun, you discover what you are passionate about. Uh, very rare you, you discover uh, your passion from doing just a nine to five job. You discover your passion by doing something that you find it really fun to do. And then slowly but steadily, you discover that's what you really passionate about. And then the next thing I just echo what Michelle said, it's just learn multiple skills. Don't limit yourself to just one particular role or one particular um, uh, type of function. Uh, explore different type of uh, roles and, and through those different position roles, you might discover uh, where your sweet spots are. Um, you know, I, I, I've gone through the exercise of mapping where my strengths are and where I will never be good at. And, um, you know, the, the trick here is don't focus on what you're not good at. Focus on what your strength and what you're passionate um, uh, areas and then just keep growing in those areas. Um, and uh, believe in yourself, which is what I would tell my younger self. Believe in myself, that, that inner voice that tell you you can't do it. This is scary. You know, I'm not good enough. All those are, are just negative energy that um, I would tell my younger self, don't listen to them because I have uh, my strength and quality that I can contribute. And if I focus on those, I'll become better each day and be the best of myself. Thank you, Christy. Um, so that brings us to the end of our panelist session today. I just wanted to apologize um, on behalf of the other panelists who didn't show up today. Unfortunately, they had some last minute work commitments and had to pull out in the last minute. So apologies for that. But thank you to Christy and Michelle, um, your insights, your experience, experience and the advice that you've shared. I'm sure the students really appreciate it. And thank you for volunteering your time um, today. Um, to all the students out there, make sure that you register um, on Career Hub for our, any future events. I've added some links to the industry mentoring program, some of our events, and also the Career Advantage um, Career Ready app. If you uh, logged onto that, um, that's a really good portal where we can um, promote some events as well. Um, so thank you so much, Michelle and Christy. If you can just stay behind after the session, that would be great. And to everybody else, I'll be emailing you the link to this session. So if you've come in late, don't stress, you'll be able to watch the whole thing. Okay, so see you later, everyone, and take care.